welcome to the Orthodox Medical Missions around the world. Um, John Demacus is not able to come. His wife fell. He had um, he had a problem. He's tried to take care of her, and then he himself uh, didn't didn't do very well. So I got a call from him like three or four days ago that he wasn't going to make it. So I am uh, John's substitute. Um, I was supposed to be a panelist, but I don't think we need four panelists anyway. And what I was going to do is um, ask each member of the panel to say a few words about themselves. So I could, I'll, I'll give a few words of introduction, but then to, for you to talk a little bit about your experience, and then we can sort of have a discussion. Um, the goal of this uh, workshop is to actually try to address the work that's going on regarding medical missionaries. Um, and, uh, and, and this includes physicians, nurses, other healthcare professionals. It's, a very, it's very broad in nature. Um, the, our, the three panelists we have here, so I'm, I'm actually vice president of the OCMC board, uh, and it's, I can tell you that it's a true honor to introduce these outstanding people. Um, Cheryl Johnson has uh, been involved in medical missions for a while. She's done several medical mission trips, mostly to Indonesia, uh, at least that, those are the ones I remember. Um, but we'll let her tell her story um, as well. She actually, this is her second O Camper meeting. We're happy to have her here. President Hedda, um, Renee Ritzi is, uh, is, I hate to introduce people by who they're married to, <laughs> uh, but she's in charge of the medical missions down at the Orthodox Christian Mission Center. We're delighted to have her. Um, her husband, Father Martin Ritzi, is the director of the mission center, so, so she has an insider's knowledge uh, to, to what goes on there, not just uh, the daily uh, working of um, the program. Floyd Franz has been involved heavily in the, in the mission in Romania, has done a great deal of work with um, al alcoholic problems and other problems there. Um, and, and so I think we've got really distinguished people. I would say these are among the leaders for orthodox medical mission work that we have um, in, in, in the US. Um, so, Cheryl, I'm going to start with you because you're just seated at my far end. Well, I want to, I have to show you my, this is my Indonesian outfit that I bought last time I was in Indonesia, so I wanted to just get everybody in the spirit of things. So, my, my experience has been with short-term missions. So, that's, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about short-term medical missions and about what I've done and what I think has worked and why I do it. So. First of all, when I, when I became a doctor later in life, I always wanted to be a missionary doctor. And I had sort of a glorified um, idea of what, you know, as a missionary doctor, I'm going to go into the field and I'm going to heal people and, you know, they're going to hail me as a great, great healer. And medical missions is nothing like that. And so that was the first thing I had to get over. But over, I've done, um, I don't know how many, but I've been to Africa three times and Indonesia twice and India once, but I wasn't a doctor yet when I went to India. So I've had different experiences in medical missions. And so after my, ex my s many experiences, I've kind of come to the conclusion that medical missions is about several things. So I kind of wanted to share with you kind of what my understanding now for me is what I do when I go on a medical mission. Medical, short term, this is all short term, and this is very different than what Franz will talk about as a long term missionary. But when I go on a short term medical mission, the most important thing I'm doing is supporting the Orthodox in the country I'm going to. It's not, it's, it's medicine is second. So when we send, when we go with it as a team to whether we go to Tanzania or whether we go to Medan, Indonesia, we're, we're interacting with the Orthodox on the ground and we're saying we come from America because we love you and we want to support you and we go and we do whatever they want us to do. And it isn't always what we expect we're going to do. And so it's, it's amazing the kinds of things sometimes that a medical mission can turn into. And we can talk about that later. The other thing that we do is that there's usually some native caregivers on, in the ground, whether it's nurses that have been at the clinic. In Indonesia, we had interaction with some Indonesian doctors. In Tanzania, we um, had some interactions with um, some of the Tanzanian doctors. And so it's an exchange of medical information. We talk about things that we do in the US. We usually bring some sort of informational books. We kind of share things. They tell us about diseases that are um, endemic to their area. So it's always an exchange and a give and take of medical knowledge. The third thing, and probably I should have put this at the very first, is that every mission I go on to, go to resurrects 
the passion that I had when I went into medicine. And, you know, you, you get, when you're in the United States, you get a little jaded. You get, you know, you're tired of the patients that are always whining about their pain or that want the next great antibiotic. But you go on a medical mission and you come back with that passion that you first discovered when you entered medical school on that first day. So that's always something that I, that I just look forward to because it energizes me sometimes for a couple of years until I can go on my next mission. And it also resurrects my passion for the church. Uh, my spiritual life has absolutely improved with each medical mission. Um, and every mission, the, the spiritual life of every mission is different. I had one mission where the church was next door. So we had services in the morning, we had services in the evening, and the priest was next door so he could do that. Other missions, the church is farther away, so we have church on Sunday, but then we have private vespers in the morning and the evening. But no matter what we do, no matter what the situation is, our, our, the, the, the orthodoxy is at the forefront of the mission. So the, the celebration of orthodoxy is an integral part of the mission. Um, I tell you, you have never experienced orthodoxy until you've been into an African church and, and listened to all those people singing. We just, you know, you're just quiet and you just let them lift you up. And you just, you, you have a new love of orthodoxy when you go on a short-term mission. And the last thing is that, that I'm going to say is we meet brothers and sisters in Christ across the world. We're so used to seeing the faces we see here. You know, there, yeah, there's a few Ukrainian faces and some Greek faces, but mostly we're all white. Um, you know, but you go to Africa, you go to Indonesia, you see the faces of orthodoxy like you would never see if you just stayed home. So it makes you realize that we really are part of a worldwide church and we are just really lucky to be able to interact with these people. So anyway, thank you. Okay, thanks Cheryl. <laughs> so uh, President Hutter and Mayor. Um, I think I'd like to kind of open the, the discussion a little bit. Um, Taking off from a point of what Cheryl had said about, you know, how as Orthodox, how we approach this. And a, a little snapshot uh, would take uh, us back to the 1980s and the first team that we hosted as long term missionaries. And it was a construction team of a clinic in a very rural area that didn't have a bus stop didn't have water, didn't have electricity, but an Orthodox clinic was being built there. And so these people were very isolated and um, very challenged when ever faced with a healthcare need. They'd have to walk for hours, usually putting the sick person in a wheelbarrow, taking them you know, far off to catch a bus to get to a city that, or a village that had a clinic. So team comes and we're hosting them and we've got the construction part going here, and they're building the clinic, and then there is catechism going on, you know, with the young people during the day and with the older people that had been helping with the building after. And then there was the healthcare ministry that was happening. And this is the kind of just a, the little snapshot. Every person that came to receive health care from this group of American Orthodox people, they were treated with, um, of course, the love and compassion of, of being, you know, an Orthodox brother or sister, or even not even Orthodox, because there's never any, any discrimination. But every person was prayed with, and there was never any pressure that you know you have to come in and seek out orthodoxy or you have to learn about it or anything because at that time there wasn't even an orthodox church in that village when that team came but as the years progress um two or three years later a school was built two or three laters after that a church was built and so now chavogetti is a, a really hustling bustling place with a primary school, a, a middle school, a high school, um, the church, the clinic, and a bus stop. They have running water. They have electricity now. And you just see how, um, as Orthodox, the whole person is looked after. And it's not just treating the physical ailment, 
but there's something deeper, something spiritual that happens. And that's how we, as Orthodox, believe um, a holistic mission is to be spiritual and physical. And you'll see that all around the world when our hierarchs um, are faced with a growing church. It's not just about establishing churches and parishes, but having primary schools and elementary schools, um, clinics, and all of the churches around the world have healthcare ministries and educational ministries to people, just to meet them where their needs are. It's just, thank you. Okay, thanks. President Heather, Floyd. Um, well, I, I'm Floyd, Floyd France, and uh, I've been, been serving in Romania for about 17 years. Um, and I became, I became a missionary quite by accident. Um, I, I really hadn't thought about being a missionary. And uh, I was at liturgy one, well actually though, I, I thought about, I, I was working, I, I'm, a, I'm an addictions counselor by profession. That's what I was doing is, is professional counseling. I was working at a, at a residential treatment center in Oklahoma. And um, uh, I was, I was, we were working with kind of well-to-do people, and it was, it was a private program and everything. And, and I, you know, I was kind of tired of listening to these guys who'd been in treatment three or four times. And, you know, I said, well, you know, what am I doing here? I'm, I can't tell these people anything they don't already know, you know. And, and uh, I, I was getting kind of, kind of burnt out on it, you know. And, and so I thought, well, it's about this time that OCMC was advertising for missionaries and things, you know. And, and uh, so I, there, was a, there was a program out in California for, uh, it's like a, under the OCA church that was a family center in uh, San Francisco. And I was communicating with them and with uh, Mother Raphael in, in, uh, at, uh, in Guatemala and with, the, with a Greek Orthodox priest in, uh, in, the, in um, India. She, he had a, a neonatal program that was interesting. And um, so I was kind of looking, I was kind of seeking, you know, someplace to, you know, to, to go next. and. Um, I'd been counseling by this time for 10 or 15 years, and I was a little bit getting a little bit burnt out on it. And so once any, I was at liturgy, and um, uh, two two missionaries from Romania came through, you know, fundraising at my church in Oklahoma. And um, so they were talking about the street kids and the huff and the glue and all the alcoholism and everything, you know. And so and so I kind of got bit by that, you know. I said, well, you know, I should go see what those guys are doing over there. And uh, so uh, quite impulsively, I told my boss, I said, you know, I've got to have a couple of months off so I can go to Romania. And she told me, no, she says, you're crazy, you can't go to, you can't do that, you know. So I said, well, okay, well, I'll, I'll have to resign, you know. So I did. And I, and I went to Oklahoma, I went to, uh, went, went to Romania, and, and um, what I found was, a, it was, it was, it was a, a little bit shocking to me. Uh, uh, I had been introduced to a, to a, um, uh, another missionary uh, is, is an Anglican lady, and she was a, a psychologist, and she was doing a thing called Theodore Ocean Ministries, which is taking hospital equipment and things into the prisons. And, um, but she was also a PhD psychologist and, and doing a, a, a training and education in universities over there on addictions. And she asked me to help her do a workshop for the, for the Romanian prison system. <coughs> and uh, so we took a train down to Constanza and went into this prison and stayed a week down there. Well, uh, when we were finished, the, the, the director of the education department for the, for the entire prison system of Romania asked me, he said, well, Floyd, we'd like for you to write a program for, the, for, for our department, you know, for, for the prison system. And I said, well, if, if I can, I will. I'll, if I come back, I'll, I'll do that, you know. Because this is really an exploratory trip. This is in 1998, you know. And, and I was, you know, not, had really not thought about being a missionary exactly. And I, I, at this time, I had on I had on my counselor's hat. I was still a counselor, you know. And uh, so then I went to Cluj with Craig and Victoria Goodwin. And uh, uh, of course, you know, then I meet all the priests and the doctors in Cluj and all these people and the psychologists and other ones. And well, we did some, uh, well, like like some conferences and things there and some education. And we, I, I mean, I, I I witnessed a lot of alcohol. People drunk on the street at eight o'clock in the morning, you know, and. And uh, uh, you know, street kids all over the place, and they were all they all had a sack full of paint in their face, and and you know, the priests were telling me, Floyd, we don't know what to do. You know, we just don't know what to do. 
the um, the people in the education department at the, for the prison system, I asked them if they had ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous. And like only a couple of them had ever even heard of AA. You know, they had no idea what it was. And um, so, uh, and, the, and the doctors in Cluj were the same. They, and what I, what a surprising thing, a surprising thing, the thing there too is that, the, is that the, all the young, all the young students that I talked to, they were all leaving the country. They were all getting out there. So as soon as we can, we're gone. And I realized, you know, that that uh, Romania was really in a struggle. And but I also saw, you know, witness the people and and, and the beautiful people, nice people, you know, and, and some th the churches there and everything, you know. And uh, so I thought, well, I'll, you know, I'll think about it. So, so I went back to to, to Tulsa, and uh, the guy that the, the business manager of the of the treatment center picked me up at the airport, and he said, well, you know, we'll see you at work on Monday, you know. And uh, so, so, so I had my job back, you know, and so I was, I was praying about it, and I, I was talking to my priest about it and everything. And, and uh, so I decided to go back in, in, uh, in 2000 and, um, and just spend a year, j just one year. And, uh, and I realized, you know, that, that it, was, it was something that, that, was, that was very much needed over there. And, you know, Romania is like, you know, 90% Orthodox real high orthodox population uh but the but the 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 church over there you know it, it doesn't it really doesn't know what to do with people who have substance, substance abuse problems and um uh so i thought well you know i'll do a small outpatient program you know and and uh, i'll start something like that and and you know they'll you know they'll get the idea about it you know and so um we started an AA group, and we started an outpatient program, and, and uh, I hired some staff, you know, and, and uh, well, after about a year, okay, we were, uh, you know, it was, it was gaining some momentum. And uh, now the second day I was there, we went up to meet the Metropolitan Bartholomew of Thrice Blessed Memory, and um, he had me come and speak in front of all of his priests. And he confronted them, you know, about their drinking, and 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 there was, you know, one of them was actually un, under suspension, uh, who who he confronted, you know, I, I was, I wish he wouldn't, he, he confronted this guy very publicly, you know, and it kind of put the, me in the position of being the bad guy for the bishop, you know, with all the praise. But, um, so from the very beginning, you know, the, the 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 church was sending clergy to us for for counseling and things, and. Um, Although they, 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 they really didn't like it very much. They wouldn't, wouldn't hardly come. So a few did, a few did. And, um, but uh, uh, then, you know, I, I, I started to see, you know, that, that uh, uh, it was going to take longer than a year. And uh, so I, I wrote Father Martin, Chrissy at OCMC, and, and uh, about and applying, because I was running out of money. I was been self-funded at this point. And uh, so I, had, I, had, I was running out of money to, to stay over there and to, and to pay my staff and everything. So I emailed Father Martin. I said, Father Martin, I'd like to be an OCMC missionary. And he said, oh, well, he said, look, we're having a board meeting in Denver in November. Come and see me, you know. So I go to Denver, and I met him. And so we, we went and had a pizza. And uh, it's a true story. For that. We went and had a pizza, you know. And he says, he said, and we had a big discussion. He said, well, Floyd, he says, uh, you're a missionary now, and I'll introduce you to the board tomorrow night. You know. <laughs> so, so on Saturday night we go and he introduces me to the board as the, as the OCMC missionary and um, so I've been over there ever since now I, I go up to Alaska once in a while and, and talk to the priest up there at the seminary and I was last year we talked to um, well to all the priests in, uh, that's under the OCA in, uh, in, uh, in Anchorage at, at the assembly and uh, I've been to Africa a couple times in Tanzania. I, I was in Kenya. Just I just got back from Kenya actually about a week ago, and um, then came st and came straight over here. Um, Kenya is a Kenya is um, is is a is a very difficult place, and uh, you know what, what I see is is that you know there's a great spirit there for sure. There's a spirit with the priest, and 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 there's a spirit in the community, and there's a spirit in the Orthodox community. Um, but there's, there's a, you know, and I'm sure that, that, that God is going to, God is going to lead and, and God's going to be there with them. Uh, you know, but, but sometimes, you know, we, 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 we can be involved in that process of how God works. 
And, and I, I strongly believe that the church needs to be involved in that process over there. Uh, we have, a, in the United States, we have a vast amount of, 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 of education and, and funding and, and understanding about how things work, you know. And, um, uh, you know, I, I, I hope that the, that the church will, will, will maintain a presence with, with, the, with the, the Kenyan Orthodox Church because they need help over there. Uh, in a very real way, a very profound way. Um, I, I, I believe personally that if, if, if we don't, edu if, if this generation of children that they have now, say between five and 15, if they don't get education, this cycle of, of poverty and you know, all this, it's just gonna continue, it's just, it's just gonna go on. Uh, and there's a, there's a discussion about how to, help, how to, how to best help, you know, and, um, I, I'm, I'm a very strong believer in, in, in teams, in short-term teams. And if, if people that, are, that have not been on teams should go on teams. And uh, it, it is a profoundly, I, I mean, I've seen people come to Romania on teams, and they just, it, it changes them sometimes, you know, just, just to see what, you know, what, what all that is. Well, so, Floyd, can I ask a question yeah. about that? I mean, you know, because I want to create some discussion on this, yeah. too. But both you and Cheryl commented on the value of, short-term teams and I've heard a lot of people particularly medical people and uh, people that are doing you know kind of outreach types of work say that short-term teams can't do all that much good and yet of uh, the people here I think that they're more likely to be involved at least initially as a short-term team than a long-term team so can you talk a little bit about the benefits of it and I know President Ted actually manages the short-term teams so she, she's going to have some perspectives on it too. <coughs> Well, first of all, I want to say before we go any farther that next year, one, two, three, four, five, six, there's six short-term teams to Kenya. So if you feel called by <laughs> Franz's call to Kenya, there's, there's opportunities, both medical teaching and construction. But, but so. those teams have not been filled, though. No, no, no I'm, this is next year. This that's, is, that's what I mean, but, yeah. but, 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 the, but the team members have not been... No, there's opportunities yeah. for exactly. anybody that, to that's join. What I mean. right. But yeah. if they don't it's fill, like there the will six. be three or there will be yeah. four, right? We're you know, thinking that, they'll all not, fill uh, with a waiting list. Well, no, that, that, that's what we're going to say. The reason why we're saying that is that we have slots, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, the answer to your, to your question, Gail, and it's a good one, and it's a very valid one. The answer is yes and no. Um, do we go over there and make huge differences that last a, a lifetime? No, probably not. But can we, do we make a difference in maybe one, two people's lives and in our own life that can last a lifetime? And the answer is yes. Um, Presbyterian can be, be more clear on this, but I know that a lot of our long-term missionaries come out of short-term teams. So that's one obvious place that, that, the, that the teams do a, a good work. But the other thing that, that short-term teams do is that they really do support the priest. They give the priest and, and, the, and the people in those countries um, encouragement to keep going. And I think that that's, I think that's one of the, the really valuable things that we do. Um, from a medical point of view, um, yeah, I think we have made some medical differences. In the last couple of teams I've been on, I've gone to um, existing medical clinics. So we've been able to identify um, long-term diseases. Um, when, we, I, when I went to Indonesia last year, um, there's a lot of diabetes in Indonesia. And so I bought it, brought an A1C machine, which is a machine that shows how bad your diabetes has been over the last three months. And that really helped educate, I, I educated the nurses about the value of A1C. So they're gonna start being more proactive about treating people's diabetes because now they can have a better idea of, of how well their diabetes is controlled instead of just that snapshot of that AccuCheck. So, so we, in, in, if you go into an existing medical community, you can start things that the, the, the people on the ground continue. So um, I think, yes, I think that we can make some long-term differences, but certainly not as much as if you're a long-term missionary. Yeah. And on the hosting side, and on the hosting side, you know, to receive teams, uh, missionaries or hosts put in a lot of time and energy. Um, and so the question comes up all the time, is it worth it? And, you know, from the middle 1980s, I've been involved in either hosting teams or sending teams. So that's been my life work since then. And I would say it is definitely worth it. 
it is definitely important because of the things that you've said, and I'm sure what Floyd will follow up with, but um, it is without a doubt where the majority of our long-term missionaries come from. And looking back on even the organizers of this um, event, Philip Mamalakos, Youthum, Dr. Youthum Kentaxis, and oh, one more, Youthum, and one more person was on our second uh, team that we received in Uganda. Philip? Youthum and oh. yeah, I can't remember who it was. They actually said it. They did. They <laughs> did. Okay. Oh goodness! And um, you know, there are three individuals whose lives were I, they say, were touched by what they experienced in Uganda. So yes, without a doubt. Pass the torch. Yeah. Well, um, you know, is it worth it? Well, I, I can tell you that 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 I've got you know, clients and patients over there who, who talk about some of the very first missionaries that came, uh, short-term teams that came to Romania back in 2002 or 2003, 2004, and, and they still talk about them. Uh, one of the first ones that came was a, was a guy, he's an Orthodox priest now, a guy named, of, uh, I think it's Headley is his last name, and uh, he, um, uh, he, he did some really nice training with my staff, and uh, you know they they value everything he said and 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 they still talk about him you know um we've had uh, uh several priests come over there and, and they're you know they're big hits when they come over there they you know they're, they're, they're well remembered they uh they're talked about you know um and it it it, it really it, it 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 gives the people a sense that you know that they're not alone in 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 uh, in the world it, like in Romania you know it it uh, uh, it's one of the things that really kind of surprised me that I I didn't understand before I went there about how people perceive Americans and especially Orthodox Americans because we are rare birds okay and uh, I mean I've had a lot oh, you're an American well you can't be an Orthodox you know how is that possible you know and. Uh, uh, you know, and, and, and it, it reinforces uh, their belief in the church that it's not just, you know, not just some kind of a Romanian thing or a cultural thing, you know, and, and that we, you know, we believe in God the way that the church is presenting it. Uh, uh, but, you know, most of all, though, you know, I, and I don't want this to sound, in a, you know, like in a bad or a harsh way, uh, but the ones who really benefit from going on short-term teams are the people who go on the short-term teams. Um, now that's if they go for the right reasons, if they go for the right motives. And, uh, uh, and I've seen people who have come for maybe not the right motives, mm -hmm. you know. But if, if, we, if we go for, the, for Christ's sake, in other words, because of what he said, of what he preached, of what he commanded us to do, you know, if, if we say, you know, I want to fulfill that commandment of love. You know, I, I want to visit the infirm. You know, I, I want to see the imprisoned. I, you know, I want to help, you know, people because I can. I, I, I'm in a position to do that, you know. It's not about how much the dollar is going to buy, you know. The money is nothing. I, I mean, it's, it's, the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the least important factor in the whole thing. You, you, you're, not, you're not buying a car and getting a good value, you know. It's about, yeah, you know. What, what, what is it worth, you know, to me to try to do God's, because if I can't do it here in the United States, I mean, well, you can actually through soup kitchens and doing volunteer work and there's a whole lot of stuff, you know, to, to do Christian things to do here in America for sure. And if I'm, re if I'm reading the news right, there's even more than what there used to be. <laughs> I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting what's going on over here. I, I, now, I, I'm in culture. Every time I come over here, I'm in kind of a little bit of a cultural shock, you know. And I, of course, I can I get the news, you know, on the internet and stuff, you know. But America's changing. Um, but anyway, uh, uh, the the benefit to the to the missionary, the benefit to the person that goes on the trip, okay, is is incredible. Uh, and I I know short term missionaries who uh, I met like in 2001, 2000 to 2001, 2002. You know, and, and it just it just sets them on fire about missions generally, uh, and uh, and we're still I'm still friends with some of them, 
you know it's it's uh, uh, so it's it's well worth the you know it's worth the it's worth a dollar it's worth the trip over there you know and um, so okay thank you yes. please please this is open for questions now yes. anybody so they talk about the World Health Organization talks about depression being the number one uh, disease impact in the world at some time in the very near future. What impact can a cross-cultural cross -cultural psychotherapist have in a foreign experience to help with depression? And I realize you got, I, I mean, you're a counselor. Yeah. Well, you know, what, what, I, what, I th what, what I really believe is, that, you know, if you go over there, so let's say you came to Romania. And... Uh, and so we had to talk to some some students or some doctors or some psychologists or social workers or all of the above, you know, which is usually what would happen, and, and all sort of groups of priests, you know. Um, what you would have is is a group of people who'd, who'd really want to talk to you and question you and and, and pick your brain and, and find out, you know, if, if, if what they knew is matching up with what you know, because they believe more in what you know than what their teachers are telling them in school, okay? Uh, when uh, uh, you know, th but that's a secondary benefit. Okay, the, the primary benefit, uh, as far as as, as the, the people themselves goes, okay, is your witness. Okay, as an Orthodox Christian, coming and and talking to them about life, about themselves, about the church, uh, and, and it'll always come up. Uh, uh, when we when we usually we go visit monasteries and things like that while while we're over there. It's amazing, you know, the impact that that, that that has, you know, on the person going, and also on 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 the on the monks and the other people in the monasteries, you know, to, to meet pilgrimage uh, uh, Americans who are Orthodox Americans, okay, that are on a pilgrimage to the Orthodox monasteries in Romania, okay, um, yeah. On, Rebecca, uh, what we were speaking about before in the short term, I think uh, some of it is. As we say in America, paying paying it forward, and that we don't. In other words, when we do something in Christ's name for someone, we may not know what that did to change their life or anything down the road, and that doesn't matter, and that might not be for us to know. But we are we are touching people with God's love. And whether or not we do something big or not, that will then pay forward, hopefully, to other people and, and be a bigger thing than that short-term mission. And I, I just want to say one thing where my, my kids and my net nieces went to Ukraine on their college mission trip. And one of the things that uh, Vladiko Daniel does is he takes them on a walk, take some of the infirmed kids and they walk into town, to into the village on a dirt road and get some um, ice cream or whatever. And um, my children were approached by, you know, villagers saying, like young people saying, well, how much are they paying you to do this? And they were like, well, nothing. And we raised the money to come. We paid to come. <laughs> we got donations. And they were like, they were like, you, you pay to come over here and take care of these kids that, you know, in the Soviet Union were the throwaways of society. And so just that touching those people in philanthropy, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think also touched our children yes. that went over Sorry. there just to show that yeah. this is something we do, you know, in Christ's name. You know, an, an example of, of how important that can be um, and there was a guy who came over, a guy from New York. He came over there, and uh, he was he, he was doing teaching, he was doing some, uh, some education about um, uh, employee assistance programs, which are unknown of in Romania. You know, so we, we're trying to kind of modernize all this stuff. And uh, so, after after he did his his, his teaching part, you know, we we're, we run up to uh, up to see some monasteries, and he, he was of Ukrainian descent. And he says, "Oh, Floyd," he says, "you know." I've got to see Ukraine, you know, just, just, I just want to see it. We don't have to go there, I just want to, because at, at that time, as Americans, we could not just pass in the, across the, the border. We had to get a visa in advance to go there. And I said, well, okay, let's, let's go look at Ukraine, you know. So we go along there, and then he wanted to go to Yash. He, he said, I'm sorry, he, he, Yash. Wanted to, he wanted to go to Yash. Now, Yash was a city about five or six hours from where we were at, 
okay, over the mountains and through the, you know. And um, I said, why do you want to go to Yash? And he said, uh, well, he says, I met this metropolitan, this, this bishop at an airport, and he says, if I'm ever in Yash to come and see him. <laughs> now, I said, Steve, I said, you are crazy. I said, you know, now, we won't get there until Saturday morning. And that bishop, he ain't going to see you on Saturday morning. He said, yeah, he said, yeah, come on, I want to go there, you know. Well, there was a kid with us, okay, and uh, uh, from, from I, he actually was from, from Maryland. And he's 17 years old, he graduated from high school early, and was doing volunteer work at my wife's program, which is a protection of the Theotokos Family Center. And, uh, and I see, I asked him, I said, you know, would you mind coming with us to help drive the car? Because I knew it was going to be a, you know, kind of a long, long trip. And he said, that, yeah, I'd love to come, you know, because, you know, it, it's a nice trip. So I said, I said, um, I said Zach, I said, well, if you'll drive, we'll go to Yash and, and see if we can catch this much fault. Like, yeah, let's go, let's go. So just, now this is like on a whim, okay? So we go to Yash, it's Saturday morning, okay? We ring the bell at the residence of the Metropolitan of Yash, the second most powerful metropolitan in Romania. Okay, he, then he's the next, he's, he's the next patriarch. He's a patriarch today, by the way. Patriarch Daniel. So here comes the deacon to the door, right? So the deacon, well, how, what can I help you with? You know, so we said, well, you know, we want, to, we want to visit the Metropolitan, you know. <laughs> and I'm thinking, yeah, he's going to throw us out of here, you know. And I, I, we, you know, I said, you know, he's not, he, you know, he said, oh, let's step in, you know. So we stepped in, you know. We said, well, just a minute, you know. And so we sat there and waited about 20 minutes. He came back and he said, well, he said, the Metropolitan will see you. Just come on in here. And so we go in there. So we spent about an hour and a half talking to the Metropolitan. Very nice. And uh, so this is like in 2004. So did he remember the guy? Did he happen to remember him from the airport? Uh, I think, well, you know, of course, yeah, probably, you know. Okay. And, uh, so uh, so we, we, we were just, you know, we, 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 you know, he would ask us what we're doing there, and, you know, we talked, told him what we were doing, and inclusion, everything, you know. And we we're just leaving. We we're just going out the door, and I said, well, oh, by the way, Your, uh, Your Eminence, uh, uh, I've got a training program in Cluj for priests and, you know, who, who want to you know, learn more about addictions and how to help people in their parishes. He says, uh, without, without batting an eye, he said, I've got a guy, I'll send him over there next week. So I well, thank you very much, you know, and so we're, because we're, we had literally stood up to leave, you know. And uh, so we were going, we, we went on, you know. So next week, here's Father Yulian knocking at the door of the day center, right? And the Metropolitan had sent him over there. Well, now, I didn't know it at the time, but, but the, this priest, Okay, he'd been trying to help. He'd been trying to figure out how to help alcoholics because he, he, they had a lot of funerals, and he was very discouraged. And he was really at his he was, he was hitting a bottom. Okay, because he was getting ready to quit being a priest because of all the problems the alcoholic. And he didn't know what to do, and the church couldn't help him help him. You know, and um, so he stayed with us about I don't know three or four weeks. Went back to Yash, started a really nice program. Okay, I mean he 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 had a home run when he went back there. And uh, so a couple of years later, we started doing training for priests in Moldova. And we've trained hundreds of priests. We've, you know, we've done, so I don't know how many sessions and everything we've done with priests. And then, what, and, and like in 2012, 2010 or 12, we we're, do, were doing so much of it that we said, well, you know, we've got to get better organized. We have to start having a national <coughs> program. So then, so we decided we would start the national anti-drug program for the, for the church, which we both co-coordinate today. Now this priest was—he went to Kenya or to Kenya with me here a, a few weeks ago, and uh, it was just—you know—he he works really well with the clergy. Okay, we work well together, actually. You know, we we because I've got a—I do a twelve-step thing, and he does it from a different, a little bit different perspective, the idea of, of separation from God and the spirituality and, and a lot of other things. And um, so you know, and and he's been a—he's—he's he's got his own treatment program now in Yash. He's. He hosts, we, we, we're doing special treatment programs just for priests, you know, we've done, we've done one for monks who have drinking problems, we do one for priests there, but we, and the, and the Metropolitan of Yash funds our counseling programs in, in Moldova for the clergy. And uh, we've had, um, and we've had priests, you know, monks, and now we've got one started in a monastery in Transylvania, where, where near, near me. And, uh, but, but a lot of it has to do just with that, with that chance meeting with the Metropolitan in Yash, 
Okay. So from the short term mission. From the short term mission. <laughs> it, 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 it's just like it's just like a key that opened up a door that we walk through, you know. And, and oh, it was it was it was serendipitous, I guess you could say. And who would have known that that meeting in that airport? Right. Exactly. Before that, even the Metropolitan himself yeah. didn't expect it. Right? <laughs> so you, you, and, and you really don't know. And you know now, that, that's knows. yeah. That, that is a dramatic example. You know, but but the, but the, the the number of of individuals that short term people reach is is I know it's it, it's high because. They ask me about people. When I go back through and they ask, oh, did you see so-and-so? You talked, you know. And uh, they ask, you know, how are those people doing and things? Okay. So, so short-term missions, is, is it has an impact on people. Did you speak the language when you went off? No. <laughs> when, I, when I go to Wichita, I have to confess to Bishop Basil. Before I, before I left for Romania, you know, I went to get his blessing, right? And he, so he, he gave me a Bible, you know, and he says, Floyd, he says, you got to do two things if you go to Romania. I see you, Grace, what are they? He said, you, uh, you're going to have to learn patience. He said, and, and, and you have to learn Romanian. So now when I go back and fess with you, Grace, I've, I've done neither. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, <it's> a, <laughs> so you don't speak Romanian? Oh, a little bit. I, I can converse, but not. You do know, you have I, a translator for things? Uh, if I need one, yeah. It, it really kind of depends upon what we're doing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't do public speaking that well. Anyway, so you know, and and uh, and actually, you know, I, I avoid public speaking because uh, I realize that that uh, it's it's better for my staff to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay, because if if I keep stepping up for them, then they don't do it. Okay, True. so so I I really uh, in about 2000 and w when I started working in Moldova more with with Yulian in uh, 2012. Uh, I really kind of stepped back and started letting them do more and more and more, and and now you know I just I, I I'm over I go over there every day or almost every day you know, and, but I don't. Uh, it, when, when we we started an EAP program, we got a grant from the Swiss Embassy to do an EAP program. I and uh, what's EAP? Uh, it's, it's employee <laughs> assistance. Oh, yeah. okay. And uh, so it, it, to, to develop one, and um, so. And I, they, they begged me to come and do presentations, and I said, you know, well, you know, I'll come, you know, and I'll speak, but it'll be short, you know. And they did the whole thing, and they did a, did a nice job with it, you know. And uh, so. I'm going to just say, what, drop, jump in with one thing. One of the things that is interesting about the, the um, short-term missions is the relationship you develop with your translator. Because your translator is the one person you're with most, you know, most of the time of the mission. And I don't know if any of you know Simon, um, but Simon is, uh, he's here today. He's a seminarian at um, St. Vlad's, and he was a translator for one of my colleagues when she went to Uganda. And they developed such a close relationship, she ended up sponsoring him to St. Vlad's to be, become a priest. So it is interesting that that, that relationship with your translator, and, and I still co communicate with a lot of my translators. Yeah, in, uh, in, in 1998, we had a translator and uh, at that prison. Uh, she was a heroin addict. She'd been in prison in Holland. She got busted for smuggling heroin into Holland. And, uh, but she got, then she, while she was in prison, she got saved, right? And uh, so she got out of prison and got herself together in Holland and came back to Romania and was doing volunteer work at a prison in, in Craiova. And she, so it's, it's part of that Prison Fellowship International thing. And uh, so she was, she was our translator. And uh, so we, we did this, like, this, this week-long program about alcoholism and addiction for the, for the prison system. And uh, so she kept asking questions on the breaks, you know. When we have a break, she'd ask, all, she'd ask me these questions, you know. I, got, I thought, well, now, she's asking these questions because she needs to know these things, you know. And um, so... And she, she said, well, she said, you know, maybe I've got a little bit of a problem. Now, I knew she, she told me she was a heroin addict, and she was drinking, you know. And, you know, now, if there's this whole thing about, you know, poly addiction and other things. So I, so I gave her a big book, an AA big book. And I said, now, you know, I said, you want if, if, to, take a look at it, just read this book, you know, and, and, and let's stay in touch, okay. So, so about two months later, she, she wrote me an email. She says, Floyd, she says, I've had my last drink. 
Now, she's, she is still sober today. Then she started the AA group in Crayola, okay? It's a nice AA group. So, and now she, she went back to school, okay? She, she's a licensed therapist, okay? She's doing therapy, or she's licensed to do therapy in, in Romania, which is a hard place to make a living doing therapy. And uh, she's actually, she went to England and did some work in England to save some money to come back and live some longer in Romania because she's, you know. It, it, it's, hard, it's, hard to, it's hard to make a living over there because, you know, psychotherapy and addictions treatment and all that stuff is very, it's so new, it's not, you know, over here it's part of the culture. It's just part of the society. And over there it's not, you know, it's just all, it's all quite new. But anyway, the, yeah, the translators are important. Yeah, they're, they're, they're yeah. Other questions? You know, one thing I, I, I was going to ask is, you know, we've talked sort of about, um, you mentioned prison ministry. Yeah. And there is an, an active prison ministry program here in the U.S. Um, and for, for Orthodox. But it doesn't seem like we've had much inroads into that community for OCAMPER or for any of the other groups. I mean, do you see a reason why there would be problems I mean, one thing people tell me is that prison chaplains are a little different than others, but I don't see why that wouldn't, that doesn't make sense. Well, I, I know a guy down in Houston, Texas, a guy named Bob Bourne. And uh, uh, Bob, uh, uh, he's, he's like up in his 70s now. He's, he was, he's been doing uh, prison work for several years, I mean like for like 20 years or something. And uh, he's, he's an Orthodox, but he was going through a Protestant program, although he's very hooked into the, into the Orthodox prison ministry program. And uh, uh, I don't know. I, I went to the prison while, you know, when I was down in Houston visiting with him, and, and we went in there and made a talk and everything, you know. And um, uh, he was well hooked into it. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, and he, now, of course, he's, 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 he does write a lot of letters and, and uh, he works with the prison fellowship, with the, with the Orthodox prison fellowship too, mm -hmm. to work with the prisons. Are prisons are kind of difficult? They're they're a little bit different. Um, uh, there's just a lot of uh, you know work, working with, working working in prisons is not a uh, you know it, it takes a special breed to do that. Yeah. Well, another question I was, I mean, if not, you got, I mean, please feel free to ask questions. I mean, I, would, I just got, I please, question. Rebecca, go. Do you ever find things on a short term, like I'd say a medical mission, that then maybe you could connect with the IOCC and help to establish some program that actually can, so, so you know I, what I mean? Like they identify an area, and then is there communication where... I'll t I mean, what I will say is I was on the board of the IOCC and also of the OCMC, and the, the goals are very, very different, okay? Right. So IOCC is about providing humanitarian aid, right. okay? And it's anywhere it go, anywhere there's need, and it doesn't matter, you know, what you are or what you're doing. Right. Um, OCMC is about converting people to, or to, to, to Christ, right? Right. And so, so while the hand of Christ always involves helping those in need, um, some, you know, sometimes those goals are very different. And so IOCC sort of operates under different, um, uh, in a different approach than does OCMC. OCMC, I think, has to go in in this sort of very individual, face-to-face -face contact because that's how you convert, right? You convert people face-to-face. -face. Whereas I think OCM, IOCC can go in you know, broadly de delivering materials to a large group of people, trying to get them to survive a humanitarian crisis. That while there is a face-to-face, -face, it's not the same. It's not that sort of person-to-person -person right, right. interaction. We need both, but there's not that much overlap in what they do. I just thought if you noted, if you, do you know what I mean, if you noted um, something that, like I think the IOCC had a program where something as simple as shoes you know what I mean, to prevent an illness. Like, it was there that, it, could you even just say, there may be a need here right. so that you, that you find <clears throat> that maybe the IOCC can address in regards to actually something that is needed in a humanitarian way. So we do have a good, close relationship with IOCC. And they held um, one of their annual um, 
events at the Mission Center. So we have, you know, that history. And there's been situations where they've gone in, built a clinic, and then we've, you know, sent a team to serve in a place like that. Okay. Um, oh, and but, one other thing that needs to be said is that Dean Trantafilu, who was actually a short-term team or a long-term missionary, was a, yes. was a missionary um, yes. as part of OCMC. Okay. So one can argue yes. that OCMC trained <laughs> the bulk of the ISCC yeah. people. Uh, and Dan Christopoulos. Yeah, yeah, and Dan right. Christopoulos, yeah. yeah. Um, so we have that relationship, but, you know, they have the majority of their funding comes from the U.S. government. So they are very tied. We looked into doing... Um, into applying for a PEPFAR grant, uh, probably about, I don't know. 10 years ago, maybe yeah. eight years ago. And the constraints that IOCC can deal with, we can't deal with. And, you know, it just, they, they do what they do exceptionally well. And, um, you know, we, we actually sent people on a team to eat. Ethiopia one yeah, year. Ethiopia one year with them. Yep, to yep, help yep. to help them in their PEPFAR grant okay. because they have to keep certain amount okay. of volunteer hours in there. And we've provided medical advice to them when they've asked for, particularly with Absolutely. Ethiopia with the HIV. Okay. Um, there was a very big project, but but I think you know I you know like I said the goals here. are yeah. different. Oh, yeah. And when they do intersect, it's great. Mm -hmm. But you know, but you know, we we everybody, both sides are doing, you know, what, what what works. But you do communicate. Mm -hmm. Yes. And yeah. You, there's yeah. a lot. There's a lot. Each other, you yeah. reach out. I, I, I think. I think that you know that you can also see part of the goals of OCMC, as I understand it, is, is not just face-to-face -face evangelizing people. It's also it's, it's building up the indigenous church. True. Okay. True. True. It's, it's building up that infrastructure. It's, it's why you know doing doing counselor training for the clergy in Romania is a good thing because they don't know what to do with the alcoholics and and there's a serious problem with addictions. But then what you're doing is training people to do face to face. Still, I mean, you know, in the yeah, end, that is the goal. And yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think yeah, IOCC yeah. not doesn't quite have that same. Goal. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. I have a question for press, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, it's uh, kind of two parts. So the first part is, thanks. Um, so the first part is, um, you know, you've you talked about like receiving teams and sending teams since like the mid '80s. And so, what do you feel like are the sort of characteristics of uh, team members that are really like successful mm -hmm. um, and have really positive experiences? And the second is, um, I'm assuming you also hear a lot of people's concerns yes. about kind of like, oh, this, you know, I'm, you know, I've got to go bury my father, or you know, <laughs> what, you know, whatever it is that keeps, you know, the people are concerned about. And I'm sure there's maybe three or four of those kind of top, top things. Yeah. We just wonder if you could kind of speak to both of those. Yeah. I think the one attribute that makes for the most successful team member is someone who is willing to to serve. And I would say maybe about 20 to 30 percent of our team members really, you know, come to the team program with that attitude. It's right there. They want to serve the church, Christ. They're willing to go and do whatever, wherever, whenever the need is. And, but they're the minority. A lot of people go because they want adventure. They want um, the excitement of saying, I went to Kenya, I, um, you know, did medical missions, or I did uh, a camp in, you know, Napaskiak, you know, Alaska. So servanthood is definitely the number one. And the willingness to be open to serve the church whether, you know, like Cheryl, I mean, I don't think you ever got around to the second part. You kind of hinted that you would get to oh. some of the things that, you know, healthcare teams do. But um, the willingness to, to be able to adapt, to be, uh, to take leadership, and that's part of servanthood. And, you know, especially just to, you know, if it's, you know, wiping kids' noses and babysitting them versus, you know, this lofty ideal that they may have had about doing something else. So um, so that's part A. And the second question was... What are some of the kind of common concerns people have? Uh, safety in different countries. Yeah, and if you just kind of speak to those. Sure. So as a mission center, you know, we, we do put 
the team member safety first. So when there's stuff going on, like for example, uh, a team just came back from Kenya, and as we've, many of us have been following in the news, Kenya just had an election that failed, and they did a redo, and um, so you know, you know, we'll follow all that stuff ahead of time, and then we try to give team members the information that they need to not be anxious about that. And of course, some, some of them worry about, you know, exactly day to day their itinerary and things like that. But I think safety is their number one concern. And then is, you know, what are the accommodations going to be like? And things that, I guess, you know, we all want to know that stuff when we travel someplace new. Um, but, you know, if they've got that attribute of, you know, being flexible and wanting to serve, I think that's when you find just the perfect situation for people's hearts being opened and broken for the needs in the field. And they see the church alive and, of course, struggling or, or well, but, but vibrant in a place around the world where a lot of times they'll come back and they'll say, Where's the beating drums? Where's the excitement for taking communion? Where's the women's ministry? Where's this? Where's that? That they had experienced for their couple of weeks when they were out. But it was that, that willingness to have that open heart that's broken for Christ and to, to be that servant and be flexible. Well, and I'm so glad you mentioned that because I think that one thing I've noticed is that sometimes you go over for the wrong reasons and you come and you get changed so much that you actually find out you're there for the right reasons. I mean, and I think, so it's really hard to, you know, answer that, you know, who's ready to go, who's right to go. It's a very hard question. Let me just add another thing, which has been interesting to me. As I have had several, te- you know, I'm obviously I'm not a young person anymore, but most of the team members are young. They're, you know, they're they're young people, usually in their tw- in their twenties, and I have been really surprised at how many parents have been very much against their children going on these short-term teams because of safety concerns. And I thought here, or- and you know, they're Orthodox parents, and these kids are having to to really buck their parents' desire for them to stay home to go on these short-term missions. So that, that makes me sad that our church as a whole in America isn't supporting their children going out and doing short-term missions. Yes? I'd like to speak to that a little bit. I came from a Mennonite background. So there was a lot of service ethic in the Mennonite church, but it was really fueled during the Vietnam War <laughs> because um, we were... Conscientious, conscientious objectors, and so our men, um, instead of being drafted into the military, um, were drafted into alternative service. So it was kind of like a, a thing that we all had to do mm-hmm. was do an alternative service. And not only were the people who were drafted doing that, but all you know their peers were saying, "I'm doing that too, whether, whether I'm drafted or not." And it became sort of an ethic for for the church as young people to to do a year of service, two years of service, or something like that to mm-hmm. to be overseas. So a lot of my contemporaries, for example, have been overseas. Most of them have, actually. That's really changed the church. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think the one thing we, we have noticed is in becoming Orthodox is that there is that lack, um, mm-hmm. that, you know, churches tend tend to want to make a lot of money and have their bazaars and and pretty insular in many ways. But uh, going overseas for a short period of time really does something for the church. It really can change the church. And I'd really like to see how maybe that that ethic can be promoted um, uh, to have more and more and more people in their earlier years to uh, go overseas and see that no, not everything is like the way we know it here. Right. And what does that mean for us and how that changes us? I mean, your eyes are different when you come back, um, no matter if it's a long time or a short time. Um, so I'd like to know if there are strategies to, to uh, follow, to plan for. 
Well, I'll speak and then I'll let Presbyteria speak because she has more of an idea. But one of the things that, that and, when and let me just say we have we're, we're at all, okay. we're like at minus one minute. Okay, I'll, I'll be real. I'll be real quick because I think that's a really important question. Every mission that, that that OCMC sends people out on, they always ask them to a make sure you make a presentation in your church when you come back, and other churches if you can, and B, write a, a, a little a blurb about your experience because they have an OCMC newsletter and that goes out to a lot of people. So, but it's it's still very limited. You know, it, it's our church and it's the people that get the newsletter. But, but I agree that absolutely we need to have much more of this awareness um, across the, all archdiocese. Yeah. Yeah, we really we rely on people that have gone um, in the small mailings that we do. Um, our board members are great promoters of what we do, um, but it's there's a lot of work to, to, that still needs to get done because we were coming from this, you know, um, kind of closed mindedness towards missions, and in the '60s, '70s, and '80s, it just started to become more. You know, understood that this is part of our Orthodox ethos, and we look back further in our history, and we saw yes, it is Orthodox, but we still had that attitude that, you know, it's not really for us, and so that's slowly changing. In the 80s, when we started doing fundraising for our long-term service, people said, "What? There's Greeks in Kenya? What are you doing in Kenya?" <laughs> and the, now I think that attitude is less so but there's a lot of work that still needs to get done. So. How about inner city in the United States as a way to also help, I mean, to, yeah, so it's a lot of. I'll, I'll speak mean, to that, I'll speak okay, to that. Okay, yeah, so, a lot of our parents so think we've that been, that's like another world. Yeah, it is, it, it is <laughs> but, but OCMC's been somewhat restricted from, by the, you know, we're under the Assembly of Bishops and we do what the Assembly tells us to do to some extent. Okay. And we've been restricted from doing a lot in the U.S because that scene is the realm of the church here and not something to be done outside. The exception to that has been Alaska, where we've still had some Alaska efforts. Now, we could argue about that. I'm, I actually totally agree with you. And I think that we, that we should be doing some programs here. But unfortunately, um, I, think, I think that there are enough problems with discord among the bishops that we wouldn't want to, wait, I shouldn't say that for the tape. You better take that off. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I don't want to, actually, it's, yeah. it's, not, it's not only discord, but it's more like, you know, we have eight bishops in a city. Who is responsible for what happens there? That yeah. becomes the problem. And so you can't agree. I, I, don't, I don't think any, any single parish can say, oh, we're going to just go to this portion and not have the blessing of the other bishops to do it. And so the, it become, the, our jurisdictional problem in the U.S. is amplified because of this. Okay. The, I don't know if that answered it, but I think that's the truth. And because we're out of time, I just want to say, all of you guys here, now that you know, you take this information back to your parishes. Presbytera has information for you to take. So it's just, again, person, one person at a time. Well, so let, let me just Thanks. also say that a lot of, in a lot of your cities, OCMC has like banquets and dinners and things like that. And we invite short-term missionaries and long-term missionaries to those to come and talk. And it's, a, it's another way of promoting OCMC in your communities. So please you know, try to support those events, try to participate in them. Um, I think it, it's, a, it's a way to help, and yet it's also a way to spread the word.